is the name of our show. <laughs> Hi, everybody, and welcome to The Large Glass. My name's Todd. I'm Terry. And this is our weekly show where we bring you a new artist to talk to every week. How's it going? How you doing? I'm doing all right. How are you doing? I'm okay. Okay. So we've got a whole bunch of people in the chat. We've got a first-time chatter, Mark FB Studio. Thanks for following, and nice to see you. Hello. Uh, who do we got? We got Mom. Yes. Uh, Jess and John Parker here. Pumpkin Audrey. Shirley's here. Ben Paganbush is here. Marsolis is here. Yeah. A lot of good people. Boo Jazz is here. Some um, people are telling us what they're drinking already. Margaritas over in Shirley's World. Oh, Jamie Foster Jamie is Foster. here. Oh, Hello. this is good. Shaping up. All right. Oh, and oh, Carolyn Fell. <laughs> subscribing. Thanks, Carolyn. We appreciate that. You keeping up with that. I don't even know if Carolyn's here. Yeah. Um, there's Glenn LaVert, too. I hate usernames. Yep. Shirley just keeps saying margaritas, margaritas. She's, uh, that's good. Are you drinking margaritas, Shirley? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Marcellus is changing it up with a flavor. We haven't even made the drink yet. And everyone's yes. saying, here's what I'm drinking. Here's what I'm drinking. So, um, anyway. Yeah, wait till you see what we're drinking. Yeah, we got a lot going on tonight. Now, one surprise we have for you is in honor of our guest tonight, uh, we're going to be doing a giveaway. So, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the giveaway, and I'm going to repeat this a lot because some people will file in in a little while, but in order to participate in the giveaway, uh, you have to be over on Twitch. I apologize for that. I will put the Twitch link in the chat. So, if you're watching from YouTube or you're watching from Facebook or you're watching from Twitter, or you're watching from any of the other places we stream, you can pop over to Twitch. I, I, I know that's a little unfair. I apologize. You don't have to pay anything to watch on Twitch, but the interface is the best one for doing a giveaway. So, um, oh, and Carolyn Thou is here. Hi, Carolyn. Nice yeah. to see you. So I will be putting that up shortly. Uh, the giveaway, though, is an exciting one. We're going to be giving away a copy of I Paint What I Want to See. Uh, by Philip Gustin. Uh, the book's not even out yet. We're going to be pre-ordering that book for you, should you win, uh, and it will be released on September 1st, 2022. So uh, that's exciting. It's a lot of his notes, his essays, and uh, I'm actually going to be picking up a copy for myself. So um, we look forward to giving that away to you tonight. Uh, what else do we have? We have a pin winner? We do have a pin winner. Who won the pin this week? Uh, it was Maury Sinek's birthday last week. So I posted a little detail, um, and there was a very hearty response with it. People were screaming out his name. Art Ward 42 was the first one to guess it, so she wins a pin. Yeah, I think you got to get, I'm, I'm not critiquing you, but I would have gotten in tighter. Yeah? Yeah, because yeah, he's... It was so fun. I know. And his, everybody everybody loves him. His so, mark making is, yeah, you know, really I, fantastic. I, it's like, boom, we know who this is. Yeah. Um, we should drink? Yeah. Yes, we should. <laughs> I got a special treat for you tonight. We asked, um, we asked Matthew Collings what it was he preferred to drink tonight. And uh, he responded to my delight with uh, a Ricard, which um, is, a, you know, a traditional French drink. It kind of became the substitute for absinthe when absinthe sort of fell out of style. Uh, but it is a patisse, so it's got a licorice flavor to it. It's quite delightful, and it's actually really magical in the way it's prepared. So I've got a special version of co uh, for, uh, Cocktail Cam for you to check out. So let me make that up really quickly, and I'll try and describe it into the mic as best I can. So let's go over to the bar. Okay, so with Ricard, we start... I know, the microphone. I know. Yeah. So we start... <laughs> we're going to start with... Um, this beautiful bottle of Ricard here. We put two ounces of the Ricard into a highball glass. Now, I don't have a pourer, and I also do not have something to measure that with, but I bartended for nine years, so I feel like I'm fairly accurate. All right, now here's the beauty of this. It starts out as a brown liquor, uh, and then it converts when you add chilled water. So the next step is we're going to fill the glass with chilled water. And watch the magic. Ooh. Yeah, 
Yes. And now one thing I forgot is the ice. But I'm going to move some from the pitcher into the glass. That sounds perfect. And then I'm going to hook you up with yours. All right. We've got some people out there making some comments. We have Glenn saying, looks expensive. It's actually not bad. It's actually not. And then Marcellus says, what? Ah. And then we have Ben saying, cool. Now, we're going to toast each other, and we're going to be toasting Matthew Collings off in the green room right now. But we'll, we'll of course, we'll offer up another toast once he's actually on screen. But uh, here's to tonight's episode, yes. 94. 94. Uh, closing in on 100. Yep. Cheers, Cheers, everybody. You've already let us know what you're drinking in the chat, but if you haven't, go right ahead. I love this. I love this, too. Yeah. I think, it's really refreshing. I think the trick on this is I think I over-diluted the first couple that I made. Mm -hmm. Not tonight, but, you know. Last made a, night. <laughs> made a few in preparation. So. We had to try it. So, yeah. All right. So. What else do we have? We've got a few things to talk about really quickly. Um, is there anything going on in the art world? Do we have anything to talk about? There's a um, lot going on. Well, a lot of... Paul Arrego died. There's a lot of a people, lot that, of died people died that passed week, away this Which was week. not something we really necessarily want to talk about. Yeah. Uh, there's talk of NFTs again. Hmm. This is a market that's completely, like, dying. Or not dying, but suppressed. Or, or in, I don't know, in trouble, it seems. Hmm. And yet Jim Carrey is going to release an NFT. I saw that. And uh, Marina Abramovich is going to be releasing an NFT. I, I'm, I don't know. I talked a lot about these early on, like last year in our show. We were kind of like talking about what they were and trying to educate our viewers on, you know, what they meant. Mm -hmm. Kind of getting the general opinion. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Mark FB Studio says, cheers. Cheers to you. That's a lot of whiskey. Wait a minute. A limited release of Fukano whiskey and women who whiskey Japanese women who whiskey. Wait a minute, Bruges. That's a lot of whiskey. You're really throwing me off here. I'm trying to read this comment. A limited release of Fukano whiskey and women who whiskey Japanese whiskey. That's what he means by that's a lot of whiskey. Hmm. I'm going to try and repeat that after I drink this, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, when is the B pin? John Park wants to know when the B pin is. That's a good question. That's actually got to happen very soon. The B yes. pin design is finished. Uh, yes. The R pin is definitely going to be the recar. Uh, but the B pin, you're right. We need to get that out and done. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to put that on my list, and I do appreciate you pressuring me on that. I needed that. Mm. Um, all right. All right. Why don't we get into talking with our artists yes, tonight? Let's I think do that's that. actually really something and we I, should move I on. I certainly want to do that because he's in a completely different time zone. It's in the middle of the night for him. Right. So. And bef can we just do one thing before sure. we start to introduce him? I am going to get our giveaway for tonight started because I don't want to forget to do that. So first things first, if you are watching on YouTube, Facebook, or any other entity, you're going to need to come over to Twitch. Now I'm going to pop the Twitch link right there into the chat. And if you click on that and come over to Twitch, you can simply follow us on Twitch. And then I'm going to give you instructions for how to participate in our giveaway, which will be quite fun. So the first thing I'm going to do is start this thing. So what you're going to see in the chat in a moment are brief instructions on how to participate. They're going to pop up in a second, hopefully. There they are. Uh, so you're going to win a copy of the book, I Paint What I Want to See by Philip Guston. Um, and all you have to do to enter this raffle is type the following into the chat. Exclamation point raffle, all one word, a space, and a number between one and I believe it's 600. Those denote the number of viewer loyalty points you'll be spending, which are also free, by the way. Uh, the more points you spend, the more chance you have of winning. So uh, again, exclamation point raffle, all one word, space, the number between 1 and 600. And you will be entered into our contest to win. So we're looking forward to giving that away. We'll give that away at the end of the show tonight. All right, that'll be the last thing we do. So you got to stick around. Mm -hmm. um, all right, now... 
let's introduce. Okay, I'm very excited about tonight's artist. Uh, educated at London's Byam Shaw School of Art and Goldsmiths College, uh, Matthew Collings is best known for his work not only as an artist, but also as an author, art critic, curator, and broadcaster. He's written a number of books, uh, some uh, which include This is Civilization back in 2008, uh, Sarah Lucas, Our Crazy Nation, there's a whole list of them, and he's done a number of uh, video and television productions, including The Rules of Abstraction with Matthew Collings, This is Modern Art, uh, Self Portraits, and uh, Turner's Themes, lots and lots of them. Uh, he also collaborates with his wife, Emma Biggs, creating meticulous paintings that explore geometry, abstraction, precision and beauty, but recently through an effort entitled Artist Support Pledge, um, which was also founded by Matthew Burroughs during the pandemic in 2020, Collings has turned to narrative-based portraiture, which, he will be, which we will be diving into tonight. For all those who are joining us this evening, please give a warm welcome to Matthew Collings. Hi, Matthew. Cheers. Cheers. Hi. How are you? Hello. I can't express my thanks enough with you coming on the show tonight. Thank you so much. That means a lot. Thank like you for having me. So um, we can't wait to dive into your work and, and talk about this. And usually Terry kicks us off with the first sort of question of the night. Also, just so you know, I have a question that was emailed to me by a viewer. I have no idea where they're from, and I'll get to that in a little while. But the interest around asking you questions has been great tonight. So this is uh, good. Yeah, this is excellent. And just a word to our viewers out there, if you can think of any questions or you have some pressing uh, thing you want to say to Matthew, please type it in the chat and we will relay it to him. Um, Matthew, typically what we start off is with this general question, but for you, we know what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to dive right into your drawings. Right. So let's go ahead and get started. And can you um, just kind of give us a, uh, why don't you kick us off, off with an introduction to them? to the drawings as a whole while they're mm. Mm. the main thing uh on my mind about them is that i do them all the time uh, and i do a lot and but i've only been doing them for a relatively short time i've been doing them for not not even quite two years that's when that thing that you mentioned started the artist support pledge and that was what got me going on doing them i've all, always done some kind of scribbling and doodling and always had a sort of a feel for it but I never since I was about 17 I never did it very intensely you know once I started thinking about how to be ambitious as an artist and how to go to art school and how to get clever I had that stuff all knocked out of me so now I'm six, 67 and in the last couple of years it's like I've become 17 again and I've you know I've been really quite prolific with uh pictures that on the whole i would say about art history or at least they, their subject is art history that's picasso and that's an erotic painting by picasso on the wall the subject is art history but i i think the content is something else i'm not really sure what the content is i think the content is sort of life and reality nowadays and, and to some extent it's my own autobiography mm -hmm. but the subject for sure tends to be art history and some and the the people in art history and ideas and um, and uh, groups of people and types of art, which everyone who's into art has heard of, and that the 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 artists that are popular at the moment occur the most. People assume it's because I love them, but I don't particularly. I don't really love artists or have favourites or anything like that. Uh, I draw them because I know people like them. Or people think about them, uh, have ideas about them. Like Picasso, we've all heard of him. And Philip Guston, everyone loves him because he did something that people think is good. He turned art from the from art about itself to art about the social world. And Hilma Rath Clint, because she's a woman and she's spiritual and she's sort of... Uh, she did abstraction first before men did. So we've all decided we've got to love her. Uh, Francis Bacon, I don't know, he's a character, people like him, they like to hear about the colony club, the colony room where he hung out, and they, they like to know about his crazy deeds. Uh, so the uh, 
the things in art history that people like, I tend to draw them the most. And sometimes I bring in a bit of rock culture insofar as it overlaps a bit with art, or certainly for somebody of my age. So uh, David Bowie, David Bowie. Yeah. comes in and Iggy Pop and the Rolling Stones, uh, Jim Morrison and Lou Reed. Mm -hmm. And they're always uh, taking heroin and committing suicide and you know doing the interesting things that, that rockers do. Uh, and then sometimes poets come in, especially 50s confessional poets, Sylvia Plath and Anne Sexton and, and Robert Lowell. Um, and I realised after a while that the things that came in, I didn't really know why I was doing them when I did them, but I realised looking back on it, that they tend to be things that have overlaps with my own life uh, of one kind or another. So I'm often indirectly expressing preoccupations to do with my own history. That, that's actually Andy Warhol and Francis Bacon, mm -hmm. and they're, uh, they're dancing a dance of death with uh, wine and five pound notes and, and fiddles. It's a sort of death hoedown. <laughs> uh, I, I'm interested in death because my father committed suicide just before I was born. So death was a sort of very strong element in my life from, from when I was little onwards and, and caused me a lot of trouble throughout my life. Mm -hmm. And the confessional poets I'm interested in because they all had nervous breakdowns and committed suicide. So my father committed suicide and my mother had nervous breakdowns all the time. So that's a big deal in my life. Oh. Mm -hmm. But of course, I'm also interested in, in, in the great art of those poets. In some ways, I take, um, you know, 50s poets more seriously than art because I know art much better you know I sort of know too much about what what goes on backstage with art to, to to be very reverent about art whereas with literature and particularly poetry it's an exotic thing for me you know, and I'm I'm sort of more reverent about it and more amazed I suppose by it but yeah so I don't know what else what else do you want to know about them hmm. well um there's a lot of you know like I a lot of the uh, sort of viewing of some of the interviews you've done and some of the research I've done leading up to tonight's talk, I'm really interested in this notion of how you sort of begin the creation, more about the process, like where the impetus to start okay. that drawing lives, and then how that drawing develops as it goes. Because I've heard you say some interesting things about beginning points and end points and the evolution that takes place between those two places. Wow. Well, the thing that's on the screen at the moment is de Kooning working on Woman One. And the art critic Maya Shapiro has come round and there's uh, Elaine de Kooning. And they're all smoking cigarettes because it's the past. But I began that not really knowing what it was, really. It's, uh, and I often begin with nothing. I begin with an eye or something. Mm. Uh, if, very rarely do I begin with the whole story. Or, or I don't even know who the people are going to be. They might be Jesus or... or um, or de Kooning or uh, Hilmar F. Clint or an angel or, a, you know, I just as often start not knowing what it's going to be as I do knowing. And in this case, I can't really remember. That is quite a recent picture. It doesn't really look like Elaine. I think it looks a bit like Bill de Kooning and a bit like Maya Shapiro, only at the wrong ages, because Maya Shapiro looks very young there, whereas mm. in fact, he was the same age as the de Kooning. But... I knew that he had to be in that picture because de Kooning's working on Woman One and a, a big sort of mythological moment for de Kooning is that he'd been neurotically doing this painting. He wasn't even sure if it was a painting for a year, just sort of doing it and undoing it and doing it and undoing it. And he didn't really know what he was. And, you know, he'd had a show and people liked him in the art world, but he was very poor. And then Maya Shapiro, the art historian, comes round and says, well, that thing you're doing that has that sort of woman in it, that looks like a painting. Mm. And that was Woman One. And so that was the beginning of the sort of hero de Kooning that we now know of. Uh, so I've drawn this scene many, many times. And I've, every time I do it, it's from a different angle and, not, and in a different style and has a different emphasis. And sometimes it emphasizes the painting and sometimes it emphasizes de Kooning. And um, sometimes there are other people in the room you know, it really did happen that Maya Shapiro really did come round, but sometimes all the abstract expressionists are in the room, or sometimes all the women abstract expressionists are in the room because they admire de Kooning. Uh, and sometimes artists of my own time or nowadays are in the room. So to concentrate on process is hard because I have to sort of reverse engineer it a bit. And I don't even really remember how that 
picture started. Yeah, but what's really interesting about this is as you described de Kooning's process of creating Woman One and not really even knowing what it is until he sort of is getting feedback on it, you in turn described your own on some Well, uh, I respect that um, open way of working that the abstract expressionists uh, on the whole had, or the myth of abstract expressionism says that they all did, but of course some didn't. I respect that open way of working, uh, but it also includes, as far as I idealize that movement, a very uh, insistent sort of interest in structure. So it's open in terms of, you know, what will happen in terms of the subject matter or where people will be or what they'll be doing or how the angles of the cigarettes will connect. But it's very uh, law, law conscious, visual laws conscious. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a sort of, um, it's not that free in a way. It's sort of free and open because the, these things that, that people, when they see the picture, think are the main things are not really the main things when you're doing it. When you know, I never think, oh, that's Elaine or that's Bill. I think that's uh, round or that's angular or mm. there's an angle there and there's another angle somewhere else that's a bit like it. How many angles do I need mm. so that the whole thing will appear like one thing instead of a pile-up of incidents or a pile-up of things happening, an arbitrary accumulation of things? Mm. And then, um, and so now I see it and I think, and I can say to you, there are four figures in that picture Mm -hmm. de Kooning, woman one, uh, Elaine, who in a way is woman one, because she was his woman one, mm. and and Maya. And Maya's got a cup of coffee, and Elaine's wearing a belt, and Bill and Elaine are smoking. But I didn't... And there's some tubes of paint uh, um, in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, I mean, that's a picture which actually is left relatively open still. It looks as though it could still move around a bit, but of course I never will move it around because for me, the structure really is there. But you know, sometimes I'm always interested in structure really. Mm. And sometimes I have a structure which is apparently open and a structure which, or other times I have a structure which is apparently very tight. But for me, they're always tight. Right. It's just that this one is made out of gases. And at other times, it's made out of solids. Right. You know, it's really, like, rigid. Right. But structure is the thing. I'm, I'm always thinking... I didn't get that from de Kooning. I got it from, I don't know, wherever anyone gets anything, really, you know, like experience. Uh, but I, I, I enjoy it in de Kooning. I enjoy his playfulness with it, you know. And, and to some extent, I, I do enjoy it with Gustin, or... Gustin's an incredibly limited visual artist, but he's an exciting mind, you know, he's an exciting figure. But I guess in there's no one really that I draw where I really can't bear what they do. <laughs> and that I just don't really go there. I'm gonna pop uh, through, I'm gonna pop through some images as we're talking, just so people yeah, can yeah. kind of get a sense of, you know, what's you know, what oh, that's Rembrandt drawing um yeah. Sasha yeah. by candlelight. It's a beauty. That is a beauty. Um, so let me jump over. I want to ask this question that one of our uh, one of the viewers sent in for you, just so we can kind of because this is a subject around the work that I'm really interested in talking about. But this comes from a, a viewer named Picard Dor, um, and Picard Dor asks a question for Matthew Collings on your program tonight, please. When your work is focused on art history, it is often carried by an unreliable narrative. As we generally live in a world of unreliable narrative, I wonder if that is what influenced your concept or whether your work simply fell into that space, flowing with the zeitgeist. Either way, in my view, it makes your work completely contemporary in nature. Thanks in advance for your reply. Well, thank you, Picador. Uh, as, as it happens, we've been looking at a couple of pictures where there's a pretty straight, reliable narrative. But it is true that most of them are sort of magic realism. They, they have sort of uh, almost idiotically unlikely encounters. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, Frida Kahlo is doing things with Hilmar F. Klimt and Philip Guston and uh, uh, Francis Bacon. You know, they're all at some kind of summit meeting where they're discussing the war in Ukraine. I'm going to try and find one of those while you're talking. Go ahead. 
actually that's another straight one actually that's a curator who who was sacked from the Tate gallery for objecting to the Guston show being cancelled right. so I'm sort of I'm acknowledging the greatness of that guy Mark Godfrey yeah, Guston is painting Mark Godfrey this is quite a but recent that, but, thing yeah but as I say that that's a straight one uh, usually they are unlikely encounters and and Picardor's question was does that have to do with fake news I guess he didn't use that phrase it doesn't really, but it probably strikes a chord with people because it's in on everyone's minds. I think more for me, it's that in my mind, my sense of art history, I'm I'm very aware of it being a jumble of sort of bits and pieces of information that I don't really know what to do with. And so I present them in, in that way, in that I don't know what this is. I'm putting them together. Gotcha. That's Picasso in his studio drawing a painting a lovely picture and he's sharing his studio with Hilma Raff Clint. She's in the background. Uh, both of them are doing pictures that they really did do. Um, and Hilma's sending, you know, she's a spiritual artist. So she actually got instructions from spirits how to paint. And so she's a great subject for me because it's all this crazy nonsense around her mm. that people love. They never question and they, they think they really are spirits, I guess. Mm. But um, she sent a spirit over to have a look at what, what Picasso's doing, or maybe to help Picasso, or maybe to make Picasso be more spiritual, because it, you know, he, we don't think of him really, we think of him as the opposite of spiritual. Completely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so then in terms, and I think this is a really good example then of one that sort of falls into that, that unreliable narrative, but I love the way this sort of gives us insight into another way of looking at connections, whether or not they're actual connections. There's some interesting things that take place there. Well, you know, I think that's a moot point to Picardor's question. What you just said is, is very, very important to me, actual, like truth. To me, they're full of truth, the pictures, mm. except for the obvious untruth, you know. So there are bits of truth in there. Mm -hmm. um, that that's a, that's a pretty straight one, you know. That's Eve Babbitt's. That I don't know if that is actually pronounced Babbitt. Is it Babbitt's or Babbitt's? That I novelist. Thought it, I thought it was Babbitt's, but Babbitt's. Yeah. Who? There's a famous photo of her playing chess with Duchamp nude. And um, I mean, what's unreliable there is that all her books, posters for her books, are all around around them. And uh, it's a famous black and white photo, of course. But I've made it into a sort of painting. I remember that photo actually. Yeah, it's a well-known photo. I think when um, boys think that avant-garde art is good, it's usually because they've seen photos of nude women. <laughs> Especially if they're playing chess. Um, yeah. So I had I had a thought about this though, because you know I I when we were talking about when I when I read Picardor's uh, comment about unreliable narrative, and I started thinking yeah. about I started thinking about some of your notions of myth. Uh, and and myth making, I I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't help but reference Joseph Campbell, and and some of the more sort of uh, ways in which myths help to shape our understandings of, you know, things as cosmic as the way we inhabit our bodies to the ways yeah. in which cultures understand their own sort of you know rituals and rites of passage and so on and so forth. But this one strikes uh, something new to me because it offers up a new version of a world that we're always so steeped in, you know, like a, a kind of uh, rigid structure. You're, you're kind of presenting this to, to us in a, in a new and interesting way. So, well, I think these are, <coughs> these are very much shared myths. Um, the, the only thing that I bring in that, well, this, these are uh, three sort of heroes of art with their mothers. There's Francis Bacon with his mother, uh, Winifred, and Lucian Freud with his mother Lucy, and Philip Gusson with his mother Rachel, who whose name was uh, Rubenstein, I think, because mm. uh, Gusson's name was Rubenstein. Um, there's those figures, Freud, Bacon, and Guston, are unreal figures, really, but but they have a very great load of people's projections, fantasies, and ideals. That's the sense in which they're mythological figures. Although they are real people who did real things, there's a certain amount of art historical record about what they did. You know, you only have to look at that record with any intelligence <coughs> and, and sense of analysis to see really how flimsy and thin it is and uh, compared to one's fantasy. Mm. But because the fantasy is not the, the factual record, it's one's desires. Mm. And... and Whereas we all share 
knowledge, if we're into art, we share knowledge of those figures. We all have individual desires and, and concerns and preoccupations, as well as collective ones. And, and I, when I'm drawing, I'm thinking about that. Um, that's kind of, when I said earlier, I don't really know what the content is. I know that the content is something to do with that. The subject is those figures, but the content is something to do with what we want from those figures. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, in a sort of school teachery way, I would say I, I'm, I'm only doing really what history painters did. It's just that I'm doing it on a small scale and with pencils, right? Instead of a great big epic scene of Napoleon or, or, or some kind of 18th century hero. Mm. Uh, uh, and and those those scenes were about uh, c- current events or historic events or biblical events or mythical events in some way. There might be real events or mythical, and they might be biblical or they might be classical myths. But what they were really about were the preoccupations and aims of the age in which the artist lived who painted those history paintings, and and that's really what I'm doing. So that question from Picardor. As insofar as it related to fake news, of course, that is part of our anxiety at the moment. Yes. Uh, and sure. so, and so that would strike a chord with people, and it and it sort of strikes me as sort of um, a certain truth when I when I do it. But I'm not only I'm not only dressed. I would never say I wouldn't publish a book of these and say uh, here's my comment on fake news insofar as art goes. Of course, of course. Uh, just apropos of the image of the artists with their mothers, my mother is asking in the chat room what medium you're using, and so I thought this would be a good time to talk about your choice of materials. I can show you, actually. I use, oh, uh, I use a funny sort of children's crayon, which parents will know, called Woody Stabilo which are very cheap. Uh, is that on the screen? Oh, there it is. You've oh, got to come over a little bit. Hard to coordinate. Oh, wow. It's so hard to coordinate. Oh, there it is. I know, yeah, it's yeah. backwards. And upside yeah. down. <laughs> sort of great big child's crayon. And that makes that greasy, opaque effect that makes it look a bit like oil paint. And then I use um, colored pencils of various kinds, M- mainly, uh, um, you know, pretty straight, uh, Colored pencils that you get in a big tin and cost a fortune, right. and then various other pencils that are more charcoaly or pastely or chalky. But really, it's colored pencils is the medium, and they all say you know uh, the medium is colored pencils on paper. Mm. But I actually use so many different types of pencils, and I I use the, the those tools, those materials in such a variety of ways that it is a bit confusing what the medium is. And, they, and and my history is of painting and my interest is in painting. So I draw in a kind of painterly way. Right. And I have to say, when we receive, we, so for those of you who are watching, we purchased one of Matthew's pieces and I was just <laughs> dumbfounded when I opened it up and saw how rich, the, the photos don't do it justice no. uh, on Instagram. Mm-hmm. There's a thick richness to uh, that waxiness and the layers uh, that just blew me out of the water. And, I, and, and now that I'm looking at this one, for example, and I start to think about, you know, I have questions about this notion of likeness, which I'm not going to ask right now. But, you know, I know bacon and I, you know, in, in this image, I know bacon. It has something to do with his pallor. You mm-hmm. chose this like yellow color for him, which kind of speaks <laughs> to his alcoholism and his just general kind of sl- jaundice. Yeah, yeah, he was never in good shape. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, with Gustin, it's the red plaid shirt. But it's just, you know, the, the, there's, there's certain signature elements to uh, the way you've drawn these that the materials seem to really bring out or accentuate somehow. It's a perfect choice. Well, well, thank you. I'm glad that you say that because um, those are things that, to some extent, they're in my conscious mind when I'm doing it. But you know, I would never have known towards the end of that picture that Bacon's face was yellow. To tell the truth, I would just be thinking about um, in my mind there's a sort of color wheel, and I was probably thinking about some kind of opposite to the turquoise surround. So his clothing and his face had a sort of opposite sure. colouring to the turquoise. So, uh, you know, and and Lucian Freud looked a lot more like Lucian Freud when I began that picture. Mm-hmm. But it didn't matter towards the end that, you know, 
he's the sort of skinny rat like guy in the middle yeah. the other two very like how they really look whereas often when I've, I've drawn a Lucian Freud a lot um, and I usually make him look like he looks but because there's a whole group here it's sort of it didn't matter I think when you see the title and you see who everybody is you just sort of go along with the, with the uh, um, the illusion you know yeah you think sure. oh, okay, that, that probably is Lucian Freud all right, let's. You you had another one you wanted to pick, right? Oh, I was just going to throw a couple more up. I, on I the see screen. you. I see you messing with so, my. Uh... Yeah, and we have. So I've loaded up over a hundred images. I think we've gotten to five so far, but we're not going to go through all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but we're just going to kind of. That's uh, uh, women that. supporting each other. That's Lee Krasner, who's going around to Joan Mitchell's place and uh, encouraging Joan. Um, and there's some big cans of paint on the floor with brushes sticking out and if you really look in this look in on that floor that sort of red shadow that she's standing in there's a few brushes on the floor there's a great big house painting brush near uh, lee krasner's uh, leg yeah. and then there's a big sort of summary color painting by joan and lee's uh, standing in a uh, in light from an electric light bulb uh -huh. mm -hmm. So is that Pollock's? Is that, is that Pollock's brush lay in there? Is that sort of a, a, a reference to him? Could be, yeah. I mean, pots and brushes and paints are, are kind of. If anyone's a splashy painter, the studio, the stuff in the studio tends to look the same. You know, so I give everyone Pollock's brushes. Oh, that, yeah, that makes sense. Pollock, actually, everyone gets Pollock's pots, but I give everyone um, Philip Guston's light bulbs. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I like yes. that, too. You know, and there's another thing about the smoke, actually. Um, Mark FB Studio in the in the comments is saying, I always love the smoke. Um, there's something about the shape of that smoke that does something. It's directional, but it's also very defined. Oh, I often look at it as a dialogue, too. I know that it's supposed to be like the, the suggestion of smoke, but it feels like there's something else happening. Whenever I see it, that's what I'm, I'm thinking. Yeah, sometimes... Um... It's nice if you feel that they are like, you know, like those Rolands and uh, 18th century cartoons or Gilray cartoons where they have speech balloons with obscure English writing in them. Mm -hmm. I mean, in that one, that's more emphasised. I mean, those plumes are, you know, smoke is useful because it, it makes an organic sort of modern art shape. Um, they're, they've become elongated and they're instead of being wispy and disappearing a bit they're almost like objects mm -hmm. and they they provide sort of rhythms sloping rhythms that go with the light the, the lines of the light coming out of the lamp mm -hmm. and, and are different to the rectangularity of the painting but they have the similar sort of coloring to the pots of paint so everything yeah. in the picture has has come out the way it has in order for that pitch to have some abstract zing to it but, you know, the smoke is an issue, actually. You know, funnily enough, the person who's bought the most pictures from me and always bought them from the beginning, he only revealed today that he's a non-smoker and he doesn't really like the pictures with smoke in them. What <laughs> <laughs> about two or three hundred of them, I think. Who about two or three hundred? Uh, oh, it's the right. first time anyone's ever... Because, of course, Goodness. everyone's a non-smoker now, you know. Of course. Yes. Yeah. If you're into art, you know, if you're... Well, if you're at all in the middle class, you, you can't help being what's here or not. You said you're earlier, you, you said earlier they're smoking because it's the past. Well, yeah, it's the past. Yeah, it's it's a sign of the past. That's, you know, all photos of Pollock, you can't see more than two or three without a cigarette appearing. Mm -hmm. Right. Or an abstract expressionist or, or any film from the past. That's made. We all know that sometime in the past we all smoked and then then we didn't right mm -hmm. so it immediately tells you this is the past but it's useful to me as a shape as well and um but you know today i had to really two things happened today i sold a painting and i was really happy and then i spent all day worrying about the smoking issue that <laughs> so i better do some of these scenes without them smoking no, I, I, I was so pleased that i'd invented this sort of trademark of smoking yeah, now yeah. I'll have to have the non-smoking one. But I have to say, okay, so first of all, I've missed a lot of questions and comments in the chat, which everybody I do plan to get to, so please forgive me if I haven't gotten to you yet. Well, I'll answer a bit bit more 
quickly. Well, because Susan, Susan Michael in the chat mentions this thing about the smoke, and this might actually make you feel a little bit better. But she says, smoke represents the long duration of the conversation. I love that. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's really, nice. That's yeah. really beautiful. Yeah. Um, let's see. A couple of questions. One, Begin Ben Hagenbush wants to know. He says, Matthew, you said you have done drawings of famous musicians. Have you ever done a drawing of the Sex Pistols? I think that would be really cool. Um, did you mention something about Sex Pistols once in a conversation I heard that you had? Or was that my imagination? Um. I met Johnny Rotten and had a nice long chat with him in the oh bar. Oh my god! <laughs> well, because I filmed him, uh, but I've never drawn the Sex Pistols. There's a there the sort of there's a show about them now. Um, I haven't. I certainly will. That sounds like a plan. I like, like that. Plan. Yeah. Um, oh, now Helmer F. Clint. I don't know how she did it, but somehow through her spiritual powers, she's gone back to 19th century England. Nice. And she's at Oscar Wilde's place. And there's uh, Aubrey Beardsley, who hasn't got much longer to live. But both Aubrey and Oscar are at the height of their attractiveness. And Hilma's all like, ethereal. And she's maybe sleepwalking because she's so spiritual. She doesn't often, she sometimes doesn't know what she's doing. But those the spirits are there to check that you know nothing goes wrong mm. i love this piece mm -hmm. i love that she's yeah i love the look they both have you know that is it oscar wilde that's looking at her no no that's aubrey beardsley yeah okay yeah I love, he was famously long and thin i love and, uh, oscar wilde had a great big fleshy sensual uh, appearance with long long hair but i love the three-way look she looks off at the distance and the two yeah. of them, sort of one staring at her, the other staring at him. The spirits are between them, kind of, you know. I love this piece. Uh, oh, another you. quick question from the chat real quick. So John Park says, myth-making, fictional biography, romanticizing the past, satire, or maybe some other concepts. What is behind these in your mind, or do they all have different thought processes? Um... I think that's a, a good question. I think there is a single thought that covers them all. And that is my, I think that my subjective holding of all these stories and images and ideas and fragments of ideas is probably to a little, a certain amount universal at least as far as people into art goes. And maybe beyond that, because everyone's into figures and bodies and faces and relationships. Uh, but to satire, to satirize them is to not take them, is to attack, <laughs> attack a sort of creed-like reverence for art history, which I don't have, I don't have that. I mean, I read, all, read art history all the time and I'm immersed in it greatly. But I think people who are, who are very much into it are not reverent towards it you know it's a stone that they're always turning over and i never go to an exhibition to have something confirmed that i already know you know i'm bored and fall asleep if that happens i i always go to to question it and find something wrong with it you know put have to put it back together in my mind so satire is really a breaking down and an undermining and a teasing of something that's monolithic mm. uh, and i think that comes natural to me because I want to break down thoughts and, and see what possibilities are, you know, crack them open and produce new ones. Th these are the pre-Raphaelites. They're all individual real figures, but there's some of them are posing to be drawn uh, and some of them are actually making art themselves. So that's, um, well, there's one of them weaving there on a medieval loom. And in the top left-hand corner, there's a very famous painting called Mariana by, uh, by, by, uh, John Everett Millet and Millet's in the mm -hmm. corner drawing somebody and Rosetta's in the middle drawing somebody else and Effie Gray's in the foreground so they all did draw and um, uh, whatever William Morris's wife was called off unforgivably suddenly blocked on her name on her Christian name she really did weave hmm. um, but of course uh, I've just made up that scene which I, you know, and this goes back to this thing you just said about breaking these things down 
and developing new modes of thought from how these things could have existed. And this, this for a moment takes me back to this thing about Joseph Campbell for a second, because he, he once talked about, um, I'm, now I'm going to try and dig into a very bad memory here, if I can remember it. But he was once talking about the ways in which Native Americans treated the buffalo in a hunt. And there was a story that went with that about how, uh, this is probably more than I need to get into with this, but anyway, the long and the short of it is this, is that the Native Americans treated everything in nature as a thou. In other words, there was a reverence, there was a connection to those things, and therefore it existed as a thou. Whereas the Americans, when they came, treated everything as an it and had no oh. reverence for those things. And I feel like in the world of art history, there are the thous and there are the its. And you firmly, I believe, are in the camp of the thou because you have a connection to this stuff that allows you to, you oh, know, you're not just turning into a stone. Thought. I love know? that thought. That's lovely. I mean, that's like the cave art. I often draw cave artists and uh, I like the idea that no one, of course, knows why they did what they did. And recently, there's been a sort of a negating of an idea that had held right throughout the 20th century, but certainly from the mid 20th century onwards, or, or from the war onwards, when uh, Lascaux was found, that they, they were sh shamanic and uh, they painted those pictures to have some kind of magic hold over the animals so that they could then e equalize the problem of man being small and aurochs and tigers being big so they could go out and kill them. There's uh, people don't necessarily believe that now, but but it did mean that in painting them, they were they were being them, and uh, I do think that's what I'm doing. Mm. And, I mean, I'm only joking. All the pictures are jokes. Every single one of them. They're all funny in some way, but they're also I have to sort of identify very strongly with them in order to make them at all. Even even commissions. This is a commission actually by a very beautiful man who lives in Paris called Youssef, who's a fantastic artist of, who is medium as photography, and he wanted a picture that imitated Frida Kahlo's self portrait, where Frida Kahlo's got a heart exposed in in one picture, uh, and and she's, they're connected by veins and stuff. But he wanted it to be him in each case. <coughs> so instead of the two Fridas, it's the two Youssefs. But, you know, I had to really, like, the, it's an absurd picture, but it does look like Yosef. Uh, and he did, when I sent the first images to him, it, he really tortured me and asked me to change little bits and everything. I was really getting fed up with it. But, uh, you know, in the end, I really appreciated him forcing me to do that. And uh, so that picture, took, although that looks incredibly simple, and it's one of the simplest pictures that you've seen, so far tonight it actually took a long time to do to make that simplicity not be inert mm. uh, i mean maybe maybe it is inert but i when i was i f thought it was finally finished because i thought something was happening that made it have some fears i don't feel it's inert at all i feel i, I love the energy between those two red spaces in there um there was, oh, by the way, Maureen Dougherty is here and has had a couple things to say. She said hi to you earlier, but she also talked about this notion of the Lascaux drawings uh, as a notion of possessing them, possessing the creatures that were depicted, which which kind of makes sense. Um, well, yeah, uh, possessing and identifying with, but, you know, these are all, I, I mean, it's probably very telling that it was a very strong um belief that that kind of thing was going on which has recently been slightly poo-pooed you know for in uh, a lot of it went with anthropology and freud mm. uh, this is an english artist called jeff rigner this is quite a disconnected picture actually but that's a a, a really good artist who was an alcoholic for a lot of his life but was an incredibly noble guy who was completely poor because the type of abstractions he did had very, very great, intense quality, but never really were on the button as far as trends were concerned. So he 
basically was the classic artist of not being particularly recognised in his own lifetime, except by his friends, hmm. who were all very, very good artists as well, significant enough. But he was a jazz fan and, and a music fan. He's got um, Neil Young's Harvest he's listening to and, and Lester Young, because that's funny, because they're both called Young. That's a very good record by Lester Young called Lester Leaps In, next to Harvest by Neil Young. And in the corner is uh, Jimi Hendrix, Are You Experienced? And then the two things at the top are two paintings by Jeff, and that's Jeff smoking. And that's his kettle in his studio on the floor. Mm. And that's his pots of paint. Now, I've never been to his studio. I went to his flat once. It was, it was absolutely tiny. Huh. I love some of the spaces that you create, too, that are sort of really undefined, like that green space to the left of the painting on the wall and some, oh, of, yeah, the, yeah. some of the backgrounds. Well, yeah. I mean, it's you got to feel that they're in a real room. But when you look at a Titian or a Gainsborough or something, you know, in a Gainsborough portrait, there's a, there's a figure in a wood, say. You believe that it's a wood because of one or two notational things he's done. But when you look at it, it all collapses. You know, there's no wood there at all, really, just some scribbles. Mm. And actually, a lot of Titian is about the highlight on, on the corner of a chair makes you think that the whole chair is painted in that believable way. Right. Whereas a painter looks and sees that it's all smudges, mm. all except for that one little highlight. But the, but the eye of the of the audience thinks, yeah, that's a chair. Why question it? You know. So we sort of, we vaguely believe he's sitting at a table and maybe there's some records on the floor. I mean, I had to tell you that there were, I don't know if you, there's also the kettles plugged in. I don't know if you see there's a yeah, little socket. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and it's just so enough. It's, there's very little actual information there, but you believe that he's in a room. That's what I was going to say. The, yeah, even the, the gesture of the plug is just enough to get us to the wall. And I think he looks like a, a noble guy. He's a because I think of him as a noble guy, but I mean, I don't, somebody else would have no idea who, no one's heard of him, but I, I'm hoping that I'll, if I draw him enough, many more people will have heard of him. Yes, but of course him. he's dead now. He's, he died about 10 years, uh, not quite 10 years ago. It was very sad. Yeah. Matthew, how many drawings do you think you produce? Because I know since you started, um, probably around the June 2020 time frame. Um, you've probably produced about 2,000 drawings. How yeah, a bit over. Now it's about 2,000, yeah. Okay. Maybe it's a bit over, yeah. Wow. How many do you think you're producing a day? Are you always drawing? Because I know you have a collaborative practice with your wife. I do, yeah. I have a, well, my wife's also a mosaicist, so she has her own practice, and we do these uh, collaborative paintings. So, uh, I, I sometimes do six or seven, uh, or I sometimes do one. And sometimes I do six or seven I didn't start that day. You know, they have they didn't sell and they're still there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, some take longer than others to sell. Some sell instantly. And if they haven't sold and they're still there, you know, they're done in this very open way. You know, I, I think of them as a tight structure, but... I'm always I'm always wanting to open that structure up and revisit it. That's a recent one of um, David Bowie and Andy Warhol and Lou Reed. Lou Reed's fixing up because he always must be doing that. And and David is in his hunky dory appearance because of that's the record that um, at the Andy Warhol track appears on. And Warhol's flower paintings are in the background, but these. In reality, these are all different times, right? Uh, put together. And, and and you knew David Bowie, correct? You you spent some time. I with did. Him. Yeah, I did know him. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, the first book that I had out, he published, and for one reason or another, it's a sort of long story, and it's not all that interesting. But um, and he used to phone up my house and. Uh, <laughs> because uh, he wanted to chat. He, he had a few years where his music career had gone down a bit. I don't think even he realised this was why. I sort of suspected it, though. But when his career went up a bit, he sort of forgot all about it completely. But in a few years where he really thought, I'm going to be an artist now, and I'm going to get into art, and I'm going to be an art collector, and I'm going to surround myself with people who have to do with art. And he did that pretty solidly in the 90s. And then uh, 
he pretty much dropped it in the early 2000s, I think. And I benefited from that enthusiasm hmm. in a way that really changed my life. And I was very grateful to him. But, you know, when someone's that iconic and uh, and wealthy uh, and uh, has had such an impact on one's life when one was young, hmm. it's impossible to have any kind of relationship with them. And when he used to phone up, I, I actually got bored after a while because... Uh, I didn't know what to say, you know, was, I wasn't interested in. He wanted to know about art, but his ideas about art were incredibly corny. Uh, <laughs> but you couldn't say that because, it's you know, <laughs> it's the wealthiest man in the world on the phone. It's David Bowie. And you're, you're hearing, you know, Ziggy Stardust, you can't believe it. You're not going to say, well, actually, that's, you know, kind of rubbish what you say, you know, it's sort of more like this. And it's funny because he was the type of person he... Well, all rich people are like this. They're sort of divorced from reality, I suppose. He was a lovely and sensitive person, but he had the problems of anyone divorced from reality. that You can't sort of gainsay them. Mm -hmm. There's no point in, you know, their ego can't take it. So, hmm. you know, these things I've been talking about with you, I could never talk like this with him. Right, right. Yeah. Because I feel I'm, you're asking me things. And I'm thinking about what you said and I'm, Try, attempting to answer but there's nothing like that with someone like him and mm. or with you know with wealthy collectors and nothing like that you know or, or uh big bosses at the tv there's no relationship with them you know because you're inside you somebody is craven because that's the way capitalism works of course mm. but part of you is alive that's why they want you mm -hmm. but there's a very difficult conflict between the two that makes it a very unnatural uh, give and take. But anyway, he did used to phone up. The children would say, David Bowie's on the phone. <laughs> and I'd go down. I it was like a film. It was like a joke film. Oh and I'd say, oh, hey, you're phoning me up. And he'd say, yes, you know, and you, you sold a thousand copies of your book. And I'd be so moved. I'd almost cry. It was just incredible. <laughs> uh, but then when he would phone up and say, well, you've sold five, by the time he got to 5,000, I was, just wasn't interested. Because he would have these marathon talks uh, where there was no point to them, really. Uh, he wasn't listening to what I was... He wanted to make a... He wanted us to do a programme where we would talk about paintings on TV. And I was working for Channel 4 at the time, and I said, he wants to do this programme. And they didn't even want it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, of course, you know, now they're, they're much more whorish and they, they would want it. Because oh, I don't course, care. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, they'd snatch that up in a second. Yep. Um, oh, my God, that's fascinating. I love that. But, but you know, I, I, if I sound, uh, I don't mean to sound contemptuous of him because he really changed my life in a good way. And yeah. for all that rather stilted thing that I'm talking about, that's that's to do with problems of interpersonal, uh, produced by a horrible society that we live in that makes it difficult for people to be really human with each other. Of course. For one reason or another, where yeah. money is involved. Sure. But... but he was a funny and sensitive guy yeah. and incredibly creative. Of course. He was just out of his depth with art, so it was all nonsense. Mm -hmm. But anything else that he was in his depth with, he was an awesome character. He was brilliant, right. He was, right. yes. Um, I'm going to ask you two last questions from the chat really quick. Well, actually, one is more food for thought for you, possibly, but John Park says, I'd love to see a drawing of the relationship between Gustin and Morton Feldman. Um, so oh. Well, well, that was a real relationship. And uh, Morton Feldman fell out with Gustin. Morton Feldman was an avant-garde composer and they were friends. Um, when Gustin made his big style change, which we all hero worship him for when he was in his late middle age, some of the um, intellectual circle uh, didn't like it and didn't like it so much that they actually fell out with him. Yeah. And that's that's the story of Morton Film. So that's a very good subject, actually. Thank you, whoever asked, whoever. That was John. It was John. I will do it. John Park. And then one last from uh, Mark Mark FB Studio. Uh, Gustin, it's like another Gustin question, but Gustin appears a lot. When you draw people, do you feel like you're having a conversation with them? Is it Shakespearean, like when several paintings appear within one picture? Hi, from oh. Mark from New Jersey, LOL, he says. Uh Right. Uh, is that Mark Fraser Betts? Uh, or different? I'll, well, he heard That's that, so question. we'll see. Uh, but maybe it is Mark Fraser Betts. 
There's a there because I know the, there's it a guy is. right at the beginning, he Mark, yes. who's actually bought some of my work. It is. It actually is him. Well, uh, hello, Mark. Uh, that's a very very good question. Uh, it's Shakespearean in the sense that the characters are conversing with you, the audience, and I'm making them do that. And so to some extent, I'm putting their strings and I'm making them act and I'm telling them what to do and moving them around on a stage. But also, to some extent, I'm playing them. And uh, there's all sorts of roles I'm doing. I'm being a director and an actor and a scriptwriter. So it's a good question. I don't necessarily have a, a totally satisfying answer. But Shakespearean is a good word for... But, of course, it, it's Shakespearean on a sort of miniature stage and in a comic mode, you know. There's David and Iggy, the cocaine years. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to laugh at that, but I just... The cocaine yeah. years, as the if the, years. that's the era. I love yes. that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Matthew, we really appreciate... We're running out of time, and I don't want to keep you past since you've been up. Uh, you stayed up extra late for us tonight. But um, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. And thank I wish so we could have gone another hour because I feel like we could just keep, we yes. could keep going here. Um, so for those of you who want to follow Matthew on Instagram, you can definitely get on Matthew.Collings on Instagram so you can uh, see when he drops his drawings. And maybe if you're lucky, you will get one. Um, and then, of course, uh, his website is Emma Biggs and MatthewCollings.net, where you'll see another dimension of his work that he works on. Also his... gorgeous work. Yeah, amazing yes. paintings. Um, thank you. Yeah, and thank you. We we loved having you. Um, I'm I'm hoping you'll hang on for a few minutes as we close up the show, so we can just thank you formally in the other room. But um, we uh, with pleasure. Okay, great. We'll see you in a few minutes then. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you. All right, let's pop over to the main window. Oh my God, that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoyed that so much. Let's get our uh, credits going and our closing music. Everybody, this was a great time. I love the questions that you asked and you listen to me right now. I'm telling you when when Matthew drops these drawings on Instagram, um, they're, they sell for 200 British pounds. They are exquisite. 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 You have to follow him. Absolutely gorgeous. I love the saturation. Some areas are really worked in and nice and fleshy and waxy and juicy. In other areas, he's very um, reserved about. It's they're they're absolutely beautiful. Ever since they came out, I've been glued to his Instagram. I'm so. telling you, when you open the piece, you're gonna gasp. It's so much different than what you're seeing on the screen because there's a physical there's a physicality yep. to uh, to the surface that is just delicious and yeah. you just you just and his mind is a treasure trove of art history so that's the beauty of it I feel like he spent his whole life culminating all of this knowledge and this is the way it's manifesting and it's just it's absolutely stunning everybody's thanking us in the chat I want the one I suggested please tell him so John Park has dibs on uh, the piece that he suggested earlier um, mom is saying thank you Shirley Ponsky I really love this episode uh, this was a fun show from Boo Jazz. Good to see all of you guys. Yes. Thank you so much. And oh, Sorry. John Park's like, don't forget the raffle. Oh, yeah. John, thank you. Thank you. I almost got away with not doing the raffle. All right. So for those of you who are not in the raffle yet, you have about 10 seconds to type exclamation point raffle, all one word, space and a number from one to 600. Do it now because I'm drawing this thing inside of 10 seconds. I feel like we should count down. Nine, eight, eight seven, six, five, four, three, two, <laughs> one. And we're going to close it up right now for those of you who are in. You are in. Ooh. I'm going to pick the winner right now. Is it random? Here we go. Baboom. And it's Pumpkin, Pumpkin Audrey, Audrey wins the book tonight. Pumpkin Audrey, we are going to order that for you. It's a pre-order. So you're not going to get that book until September, but I promise you. And Pumpkin Audrey, given your love of history, I think you're going to like this book. Yes. So uh, congratulations to you on that. And Carolyn Thou says, I raffled. I'm sure you did, but for once, you Carolyn, win. you didn't win. <laughs> All right, everybody, thanks so much yes. for joining us tonight. We Thank will see you. you next week with artist Tom McGlynn, which we're really excited about having on the show. Indeed. Thanks for joining us this evening. Grab yourself a recall before you go to bed. Yes, it's and delicious. Um, we will talk to you soon. Take care, everybody.
Cheers. Cheers.